Step 4. Byzantine Agreement. In this step, we're going to consider a very important and fun problem called the Byzantine Agreement. And it's all about handling failure in distributed systems. Agreement between various parts of a system is critical. Consider a distributed system, for example, a distributed computation. In one of the nodes that are part of the distributed system fails, this might adversely affect the other nodes and the computation itself. Failure in classical networks as well as quantum networks must be uh, dealt with. And Byzantine agreement is one such uh, protocol. Parts of the network may simply be faulty or they may be outright malicious. So, for example, in a quantum network, a detector might simply go offline. It will stop working and needs replacement or servicing. On the other hand, there could be some party in the network that's trying to eavesdrop on our quantum key distribution session or find out something about the quantum state that we're trying to share or anything else that the network or we as users don't want the party to know. So reliable systems must handle malfunctioning components that give conflicting information. And now we're going to see how it can be done. So first of all, what assumptions can we make? How powerful is the adversary that's trying to confuse us or give us conflicting information and sway our decision? One such assumption or question that we need to answer is can all nodes see all the messages or no? Do the nodes fail themselves or not? For example, uh, if it fails, uh, this is just a simple failure uh, that uh, gives us conflicting information. Or the node can be taken over by a malicious party. Is the computation finite or infinite? Is the adversary static or can it change its strategy on the fly and be a dynamic adversary? Is the communication time bounded? Or how connected is the network? And also, is the adversary allowed to use randomized algorithms in order to find out something about our communication or try to confuse us? And last of all, a very important assumption is the network behavior synchronous or asynchronous? In a synchronous network, the behavior of the network evolves in lockstep. At each time interval, the network uh, components perform something. For asynchronous networks, this is not true. So now we're going to present the original abstract formulation of the problem, uh, formulated by Lamport and collaborators in 1982. And this is the Byzantine generals problem. So there is a group of generals and each general has an army and they are camped outside of an enemy city and waiting to attack. The problem is that they have to communicate between each other with messengers and they have to decide on a common battle plan. Do we all attack or do we all retreat? For example, a single general when uh, he attacks the city may be defeated, but a group of them may actually conquer the city. And there is one or more generals that are traitors. And these traitor generals are trying to confuse the other ones. So they're, they're trying to give them conflicting information about whether to attack or whether to retreat. The command is issued externally by a king to a general. And the generals exchange messages of the form, I was told to attack or I was told to retreat. And the question is, can the loyal generals agree upon a common battle plan, despite uh, one or more of the generals being traitors? So this is a pictorial representation. Here is the city, and here are five generals. One of them is a traitor general. They can exchange messages, and they are trying to make a plan. Do we attack or do we retreat? We can only conquer a city if we attack together. If we attack one by one, then we will be defeated. And the assumptions of the original formulation were that the messages were reliable. So once a message was sent, it was also delivered. And also that the messages were true. And the sender of the message was known. So the only way where the content of the message could have been changed was uh, by the traitor general. Also, what's important is the type of messages. 
for example, oral messages, they are very easily falsifiable. And for this situation, Lamport and uh, collaborators presented a solution where the number of loyal uh, generals had, and loyal had to be larger than two-thirds of the total number of generals n. For example, a single traitor could, was able to confound two loyal generals. On the other hand, for written messages, loyal generals messages are unforgeable. This is the meaning of writing down the message. We assume that it, it cannot, be, cannot be falsified. And solution exists for any number of generals and possible traitors. So the original solution of Lamport from 1982 for oral messages, as we said, the number of total generals had to be larger than three times the number of traitor generals plus one. Only then were the loyal generals able to come up with a common battle plan and solve the problem. The algorithm was recursive and the depth of the algorithm depended linearly on the number of traitors. Also, the number of messages that had to be exchanged by all the generals scaled as the number of generals n to the power of number of traitor generals and traitor. You can see from the scaling that this uh, solution, even though true, wasn't very practical. For written messages, the solution was as follows. As long as the number of traitor generals was bounded by n minus 2, then the solution exists. The number of messages also decreased substantially, and it was just scaled as n, square, n squared, so the number of generals squared times the number of traitor generals. And the message size was of the order of n traitor. So even if we had more traitor generals, the messages themselves had to become longer. So the total load on a network using Lamport solution was of the order of n squared times n traitor squared. In 1999, Castro and collaborators came up with a more practical solution. And they used what's known as a three-phase commit approach with fixed size messages. So this is one big difference um, when compared to the Lamport solution, that the messages themselves did not scale with the number of traitor generals. The number of messages um, in the first phase was given simply by n, the number, total number of generals and the number of messages in the second and third phase scaled quadratically with the number of generals. And more importantly, their solution did not assume any synchronous behavior in the network. This is very important because quite often nodes have a certain amount of time that they dedicate to waiting for a message to arrive, for example, a confirmation message from a different node, and it's very easy to stop this message. So if the message doesn't arrive, this gives false uh, information. So for an attacker, a denial of service attack is much more simpler to execute than actually taking over an entire node. We see that this solution by Castro from 1999 is a lot more practical than the uh, original solution from Lamport. Also, there is a quantum solution using quantum distributed states like GHZ states by Ben Orr and his collaborator from 2005. It's also called Fast Quantum Byzantine Agreement Protocol because the expected number of communication rounds is constant. So it doesn't scale with the number of generals and it doesn't scale with the number of traitor generals. This is a very useful property if we're thinking about practical protocols. The synchronous network operation solution tolerates the number of traitors being bounded by n over three while the asynchronous network operation solution tolerates uh, less than n over four uh, traitors. These are the basic facts about what a Byzantine agreement is and uh, the available solutions, including a quantum solution.